Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Psychology Is. I am introducing this conversation I got to have with one of the world's leading experts in memory, and specifically in distorted memory, and false memory, and even implanted memories. This is Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, and I'm just so appreciative that she joined me in conversation because she's an absolute giant in the field of psychology and cognitive science. She's been publishing scientific papers for almost 50 years. She's written or co-written over 20 books. She runs a research lab and is a professor at UC Irvine, and she's just extremely respected in the field and has contributed so much. And I had a great conversation with her, and I think you're going to enjoy it. So thanks again, and enjoy. Thank you for joining me. I am here with Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, and I'm so excited to talk to you. Like I said in, in, yeah, in, in one of my first emails to you, I mentioned that I have shown your work to thousands of students at this point, and it's always one of the most interesting parts about the memory section. So it's just, it's really exciting for me to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting to interview people like you because your work is very well known. You've written many books. You have TED Talks with millions of views and many interviews that people can find online. And so I want to be able to give you a chance to talk about some of your kind of classic experiments and some of the stories that you've told on very big platforms for the people who have not been exposed to you yet who are listening now and also maybe ask you some questions that you're not used to answering for the people who are very familiar with your work they can have kind of a new experience of elizabeth loftus so let's just start with you describing exactly what you study well first of all i study memory and uh when people think about memory they probably don't usually think about the kind of memory that i study um, because i study false memories i study um the situation where people are remembering things that are different from the way they really were or or even having entirely false memories um, for an experience that they they really didn't have and this work has brought you into the world of you know forensics and court trials and eyewitness testimonies right that happens often partly because uh when I started doing this work, I was looking at people's memories for crimes and accidents and other important events that often are the subject of a legal case. So when I started to, you know, make some discoveries and then publish those findings and particularly publish them in places that reached broad audiences, not just psychologists, uh, but audiences that included lawyers and law enforcement, other members of the legal profession, uh, that's when I, I started to find myself uh, intersecting with those other fields. Mm. And your work has really undermined the validity of eyewitness testimonies. And I'm wondering if you can share one of the stories that, that I know you've told again on, on big pl platforms, but I'm wondering if you can share it with us listening now one of the stories of an eyewitness testimony that was false. I, I've got so many stories like that, but I, um, when I was invited to give a TED talk uh, in Scotland at TED Global, one of the big tent TED venues, I wanted to pick a case that I thought was important to me and might be interesting to other people. And the case I picked to talk about was a case involving a man named Steve Titus. Um, Titus was this, you know, restaurant manager who was engaged to be married, um, you know, had a, a, a terrific life, and suddenly found himself being accused of, of, of a rape, uh, and then being convicted of a rape that he didn't do. Uh, and ultimately, even though he was convicted, it was a, a journalist, a newspaper reporter who 
who essentially dug into this case and found the real person. So Titus was eventually, uh, you know, free of having to go to prison, but he was so bitter, he, he lost his job, he lost his fiance, he, he was so bitter that he filed a lawsuit. And, and just days before that lawsuit was to go to court where he could be compensated for all his suffering. He died of a, a stress-related heart attack and he was just 35 years old. Mm. So um, that tells you, uh, you know, it, it illustrates a lot of things, but um, one of them is just how stressful it can be for someone to be accused, convicted, of something they didn't do. And so was it the case that, that the victim of this rape identified him as the perpetrator? Uh, she did, yeah. So, I mean, she was, a, she was a genuine rape victim, but she, and, and when she first looked at a, a, a photo spread, she was not all that confident. She said something like, well, that one's the closest and pointed to uh, Steve Titus. But by the time she got to trial, her confidence level had been boosted and she was now highly confident in the trial and very persuasive to the, to the jury. Mm. One of the other cases that I learned about through, through your work was the case of the man named Ronald Cotton. And I've watched interviews with Ronald Cotton and the woman who had falsely identified him as her rapist. And some people may know that it's just an amazing story of, of many things, including misremembering, but also of forgiveness because Ronald Cotton was convicted of rape, did time in jail, and then was exonerated, fortunately, and forgave the woman who falsely identified him. And they wrote a book together called Picking Cotton, and they've gone on tour together and been interviewed together many times. And what stuck with me was when she described her experience of that process and of falsely identifying him. She basically said that initially the memory of that assault was vague. The details of the man's face were vague. But when she had selected him from a lineup, she then had a face to place on that memory to essentially superimpose on the memory. And so that then every next time that memory played out, it had Ronald Cotton's face there. And she was unable to distinguish that that was actually a figment of imagination, essentially superimposed into the memory. So this is, go ahead, please. No, no, that, uh, you've described things um, uh, pretty well. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to interact a few times with uh, Jennifer Thompson, the, the rape victim in that case, uh, a little less often with uh, Ronald Cotton, although I, I'm a Facebook friend of both of them. So I, I, every now and then I get to see what they're up to when they post something about themselves. But, you know, what is also remarkable about their story is that they, they turn this experience into um, the forgiveness that you talk about, but the also a friendship where their families were interacting with each other, the book they wrote together, Picking Cotton, and, and then their kind of crusade to be out there and try to advocate for reforms in the system to reduce the chances of this happening to other people. And that's pretty remarkable. Mm. Yes. So I, I, I want to circle back to this because I have a few questions, but before we come back to the questions I have about this, I want to ask, what has been some of the most convincing evidence that you've either come across your, or, or, you know, from experiments you've conducted yourself that indicated the unreliable nature of memory? I know that you've described memory with three words, suggestive, subjective, and malleable. And so I'm wondering what has, what types of experiments have you done that made you understand that? In my own experiments, um, we, we've shown people simulated uh, crimes or simulated accidents. It might be a film of a, a crime or an accident. And afterwards, we 
we will deliberately try to contaminate somebody's memory. So they see a car go through a yield sign before the accident, and we suggest to them, <coughs> excuse me, that it was a stop sign. Mm. Or they see a perpetrator steal a wallet, <coughs> excuse me, and we he's got a green jacket, we suggest it's brown. Mm. Excuse me, I've been doing a lot of talks today. No problem. <coughs> and, and I have, <laughs> since learned that when people are talking on Zoom, they talk about 15% louder. <laughs> it creates stress, and that's what's happening, right? You know, it's on the vocal system. But are you telling me? Are you telling me to quiet down? <laughs> <laughs> no, not you. I'm, t I'm talking about myself. So, um, so um, you know, that's what we see in these experiments: that people give the wrong answer, particularly if they've gotten suggestive information. They go to a lineup or a, a photo spread and they pick the wrong person, especially if they've gotten some suggestive information. So we've documented uh, these kinds of mistakes that people may make in these experimental studies that try to simulate what happens out there in the real world. But um, the people in this field, the, you know, the memory scientists who study eyewitness testimony, they don't just use the uh, experimental lab studies to support the malleable nature of memory. There are all kinds of archival studies of, uh, you know, what happens when real eyewitnesses go to a police lineup? How often do they pick a filler in the lineup? Somebody who's not the police suspect, somebody who's just a random, like, distractor. Mm. That happens surprisingly often. It might happen, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the time. So you actually see mistaken identifications in actual cases because those fillers in the lineup are, you know, really random innocent people. It's so interesting. I know of one of your studies too where, if tell me, correct me on the details if you need to, but you showed people two groups of people the same footage of a car accident you asked one of the groups how fast were those cars going when they hit each other and you asked the other group how fast were those cars going when they smashed into each other and just that one word primed the people who heard the word smashed to remember in air quotes here um, the cars going much faster then the other group remembered them going and that group who was primed with the word smashed so-called remembered glass on the scene at a much higher rate than the other group when there was actually no glass on the scene okay i give you an a plus for your <laughs> study good job <laughs> well i thank you yeah I've really i've studied your work and it's, it's so interesting to me and and the question, the number one question that my students ask me that frankly I, I don't feel equipped to answer, so maybe you have a better answer than I can come up with, is how can we determine whether our memory is accurate? Uh, if you want to determine whether a memory is accurate, whether it's one you're producing on your own or what you're, when you're listening to a friend or a family member or a witness in a trial or, or you're a therapist listening to a patient, you can't know without independent corroboration whether you're dealing with an authentic memory or one that's a product of some other process, imagination, suggestions, misremembering dreams as, as real events. Mm. Because these false memories that arise uh, through suggestion or imagination can have the same characteristics as genuine memories. They can be detailed. You, you can be confident about them. You can even feel emotional about them, even mm. though they're false. Mm. And now, it's it, it makes me wonder, like, I could see someone interpreting these findings and thinking, I don't even know if I can trust my own mind. So what would you say to someone? Would you even try to comfort them and reassure them that yes, they can? Or would you basically say, yeah, you're right. The human mind can't be fully trusted. What would be your response to that? Oh, I guess I, 
I, I have to say that, um, you know, obviously memory serves us pretty well. It's important to us. We, you know, without it, you'd have to wake up every morning and, you know, not remember how to make the coffee or make the toast or find your car keys or, or walk to the bus station. So obviously it's serving us fairly well. There's probably a whole lot of little more bits and pieces of fiction in our memory banks than, than we even realize because most of, most of those bits and pieces of fiction don't really matter very much. Mm. So it doesn't matter if, if, if I tell you that I had chicken last night you know, instead of a, a hamburger. Mm. Um, you, you listen to my story. You don't know the right answer. You don't know I've made a mistake. You don't correct me. I don't get caught. But when it comes to somebody's liberty, uh, then very precise memory matters a lot. And mm. we do have to seriously consider the malleable nature of memory and the fact that our memories may contain uh, errors. Mm. And I say, well, let's figure out what to do about it. Just because, uh, well, like you and I are wearing glasses because we presumably don't have perfect vision and we're correcting it. Um, let's accept this, uh, this feature of memory and figure out what we can do to correct it. Mm. And I can see someone again taking this evidence and perhaps carrying it too far in the opposite direction where they basically um, don't believe anything anyone ever says who's for example claiming that someone perpetrated a crime against them I could see you know again someone in a way misusing this evidence and uh, you know, I'm imagining the hypothetical scenario of a woman reporting an assault and the person saying to her, well, here's what you got to understand about your memory is that it's quite faulty and you may very well just be imagining these details. So I wonder how we can protect against that too and preserve some <laughs> level of trust in people's claims. That is, uh, that's going to be an issue um, because you know, first of all, I think out there in the real world, um, people tend to embrace a story when it's told with a lot of detail and confidence and emotion. Mm. So, you know, out there, people want to, you know, have a tendency to want to believe and want to accept the story and so on. Um, uh, I don't see a whole lot of people walking around skeptical of everything that right. everyone is saying. But that being said, it's still the case that somebody could use the fact that memory is malleable and, 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 and misuse it to deny, deny events for which they're guilty. Mm. And that is probably going to happen. And maybe, may, and who knows how often, but people certainly who are guilty deny their guilt and will often use whatever, uh, is available to them to support their denial. <clears throat> uh, sometimes they'll call people a big fat liar, even though they're not, the other person isn't lying. And sometimes they might, they might say, well, I think you just have a false memory. Mm. And here's some science to show how that works. Mm, right. What we're gonna have to figure out is how to, um, again, that's a problem in and of itself. And, that's a problem we need to figure out, you know, it, it, can we learn, what, what can we do about that? Right. And I suppose it's, it's interesting to think about the fact that the world is increasingly under surveillance and there's more and more video footage of everything than ever before. And I don't imagine that decreasing anytime soon. So I, I suppose, although it's a very unsettling thought to think that every public space will be recorded on video. But then again, I, I can see some pros to that. So I suppose that's a factor here too, is that more and more we'll have video evidence to corroborate or undermine people's claims. That, well, and that is a form of corroboration that, uh, that you know, might be useful to seek if you're, if, that could either corroborate or disconfirm somebody's memory. Mm -hmm. But what I've been a little afraid of is with 
advances in technology, not just Photoshop, but deep fakes, mm. um, people are going to get more and more sophisticated about altering the, the photographic and video evidence. So we got to be on the lookout for um, fake corroboration. Mm. Great point. Well, now I feel even more unsettled. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'll keep doing that to you. <laughs> yeah. What's what's just so interesting to me about all this too is, you know, even if someone who's watching or listening now were to do an experiment in their mind and simply bring a memory to mind, something as simple as eating breakfast yesterday, and then to, you know, play it out almost like a mental movie, and then to play it again but purposefully add an imaginative feature to it, you know, like a, a dragon in the sky outside the window or a white crow on the chair next to you or something totally bizarre. And just to see that that's actually fairly easy to do. And when you really look closely at the nature of imagination and this particular type of memory, this episodic memory that we're talking about, it's made of the same stuff. It's mental imagery with an, with an audio feature to it. It's like, in a way, mental video audio footage. And it's just downright fascinating to me that... Well, and, and along those same lines, we and I have shown that when you get people to imagine that they've had experiences, uh, that just completely imagine made-up experiences, it, it moves them in the direction of thinking that those things actually happen to them. That's, uh, that, that kind of guided imagination is one of the, the kind of problematic aspects of psychotherapy that I have worried about because I think it has led, it been part of the contributor of leading some patients to develop false memories. Very interesting. I think your book on this is called False Repressed Memories or something, is that right? Uh, well, I did public, co-author a book called The Myth of Repressed Memory. The Myth of Repressed Memory. Yeah. It's a great point. Yeah. And I can, I can see how, although therapists do great work, how, how that is something to watch for that as they, you know, encourage people to give me more detail, tell me more about that, that the person might be just adding imaginative details to it and then experiencing that as a memory. And it's just, it's interesting, like in that little experiment that I just proposed, you know, it, there's something I feel in my psyche that alarms me that that is imagination there, that dragon outside the window that you just added to your memory, that didn't really happen. But all that needs to happen for me to believe that this is a real memory is that that discernment needs to be just muddied a little bit or just lost a little bit. And it doesn't seem like it would take all that much to to take away that mechanism in my own psyche. And, and this is actually the perfect segue because I think that the study that was most fascinating to me that you did was when you literally implanted a memory into a, a young man who, um, and you made him believe that he really had the experience of being lost in a shopping mall. Well, we, 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 did, a, we did that with more than one person mm -hmm. actually. The, the study that we published where we planted a false memory in the minds of a number of subjects that they were lost in a shopping mall or other public place that they were frightened, crying, and ultimately rescued by an elderly person and reunited with the family. Um, that study was uh, the first uh, look that I had and, and realization that I had that you could you could distort not just a detail here and there you could create an entire memory in the mind of someone and so now you know we and others have gone to study this phenomenon how do you plant a little seed and out of this a whole experience grows and so how how did you like what are what are the other details I'm remembering some of them but I think it'd be better to coming from you, what other details did you include in that experiment to actually make them believe that? Well, the, the, so if you were my subject, um, I, I would say to you, well, Nick, um, we've, had, we've had a conversation with your mother 
and we found out some things that happened to you when you were about five years old, five or six. And we want to ask you about these experiences that your mother told us about. And if you remember the experience, tell us what you do remember. If you don't remember the experience, just tell us you don't remember. And then we begin a, a several suggestive interviews telling you about three true experiences, things your mother told us actually did happen when you were that young age. And then with the help of your mother, we made up a completely made up experience about how you were with her and you were shopping at a shopping mall or, or maybe if you didn't uh, live near a shopping mall when you were that age, we'd have you be lost in the Sears department store or some other public place. But let's say it's a shopping mall where your mother says that you, we last saw you by the pet store and then suddenly you were gone and you were gone for the longest time. And eventually an elderly woman had found you and reunited uh, you with the family. So um, after three suggestive interviews, we found that a, about a quarter of these ordinary adults fell sway to this suggestion and started remembering all or part of this made up experience. And sometimes they would provide more details, details that went beyond just the few details that I used to plant the memory in the first place. You're at this particular mall, you're with your mother, you're by the pet store. And they would come up with descriptions of what the person looked like who rescued them. Or, you know, one person told us that, uh, she remembered hearing her name over a loudspeaker. Um, so, you know, this was the first of the published studies to show that uh, you can plant an entire memory into the mind of someone for mm. something that didn't happen. Absolutely fascinating. And just to think about how their, their imagination adds those details to it is, is extra interesting. My goodness. Right. And so, so tell because me. All, the, all that extra detail had to come from either imagination or drawing on bits and pieces of experience from another time and right. another location, maybe something they read. Mm. Where did the loudspeaker come from? Hmm. Hmm. This is always a good example, this study in particular, or this series of studies of the way that we can in some cases justify pushing the ethical boundaries in psychological research because the knowledge that we stand to gain from it is worth gaining and so i'm just curious if you can kind of speak to that like how do you judge whether and i'll just back up a little bit and say i think the argument could be made that this did push ethical boundaries because it's possible that those people came out of that study with just a, a basic like distrust of their own mind and their own memory. And so yet I'm aware that you debriefed them and you were very careful about it, but I'm just wondering if you can speak both to how you judge whether something is worth doing, even if you're pushing ethical boundaries and how you can, what the debriefing process entails. Oh, okay. You're absolutely right. We, at the end of these experiments, we debrief our subjects and, the exact nature of debriefing might change from one study to the next because the the ethics committee or, or the human subjects review committees on the campuses where uh, where we might be doing this the committee changes and a new committee comes in and they want different requirements for your debriefing but but we might apologize for having to use deception and tell them it was necessary and try to say something that make them feel it makes them feel their behavior is very normal, that we don't want them to feel like a sap. And, and uh, we take them through the debriefing process. And, you know, I've, uh, in, in, of course, there are now decades of, of studies that many human subjects committees from all around the world have approved. Um, and, you know, to, to my knowledge, no adverse effects. Right. Want to know what, what, uh, what happens to these people? Well, for the most part, we don't know what happens to them after they've been debriefed. They leave the experiment, they, you know, they go home, uh, and we don't see them again. Uh, we're not even allowed to see them again. But 
very recently, I and some of my collaborators have been doing some studies where we build into the protocol having them come back sometime after they've been debriefed to address the question of what's left in there, you know, um, to use a, an example, you know, do they still have a, a stop sign in their memory, even though you told them that that was misinformation and, and uh, explained the whole thing to them. Mm. And one of the things I think we're finding in these studies is they may have a little bit of fiction left, a little part of them, just to stick with this example, even though it wasn't the example in these studies, they, a little part of them may still think, uh, maybe it was a stop sign, even after they've been told that's misinformation and it's, it, it was really a different uh, traffic sign. But there are also some benefits that arise out of these studies. They, 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 so many of them become fascinated. They learn something about memory. And in one of the studies, we even made them a little more resistant to future attempts to contaminate them. So I see this as a, as a sort of trade-off. It's a benefit to science. It's a, maybe even a bit of a benefit to the individual people. There might be a tiny bit of cost that now there's another little bit of fiction dangling around along with all the other fiction that's already in there. Um, and um, so I, I think this is, you know, why these ethics committees have been more than uh, willing to sign off on, uh, on these kinds of proposals to do these sorts of studies. Hmm. Yeah, well said. So shifting now a bit, I want to ask you about the phenomenon of people with what's called high, highly superior autobiographical memory. And I know you know what this is, but just for people who are watching or listening who are not aware of this, if you look it up, you'll be fascinated. It's the case of people who appear to remember almost every day of their lives. And it often comes along with what's known as calendar calculation, where you can just say like, you know, what were you doing on June 22nd, 2011? And the person will just pull it right up as if they're just pulling up a file on their computer. And it appears that it's accurate that, and it's very detailed as well. And what's quite interesting about these people too is some of them are severely depressed and that this has caused them to just feel incredibly weighed down by their past but then others particularly those who've had a really you know a good life a life of abundance and happiness like for example the actress mary lou henner is a famous case of this and she loves it and it's to her it's like a superpower but then there are people like a woman by the name of jill price who are again, just depressed by it and weighed down by it. But my question to you, Elizabeth, is do you believe them? And do you think that there's something real about this condition where they're actually recalling accurate details? Well, first of all, um, these HSAMs, the highly superior autobiographical memory people, um, were discovered and have been studied intensively by my colleagues in neurobiology here at the University of California are mm. very, very excellent scientists who, and, and of course they've been featured on um, all kinds of television programs. It's, they're very impressive. And I, I watched the, the one that you turned me on to from the Australian 60 Minutes. And so I'm, I'm with you on the two examples that you, you mentioned. Um, and I do think they're quite special. Um, they can remember just about everything they did every day of their adult life. Uh, it, and it appears as if, you, you know, the things check out. They don't seem to make mistakes. But get this. Um, my graduate students, uh, along with some of the graduate students in neurobiology who have been studying these HSAMs, asked the question, what would happen if you put these HSAMs into some of these false memory experiments, like a misinformation experiment or some other uh, memory distortion experiment, like, like the word list uh, false memory experiments where people remember 
words on a list that they didn't hear or see, um, would they resist the errors and be really accurate? Would they make errors? Would they make errors on some and not others? The beauty of this study was it almost didn't matter how it came out, it was gonna be interesting. And what we found is that these HSAMs um, made essentially as many mistakes in these false memory studies as the age and gender match controls. Interesting. So we, we published that uh, uh, work um, and it is kind of a, a puzzle when you see them be so able to so able to tell you what they were doing on you know June 1st 1990 and then you, you 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 go back and you look up what happened that day and they seem to get it exactly right how come they're making these errors with these other with these other sort of memory paradigms mm -hmm. um you know i've also had um uh, scientists who work with the neurobiologists tell me that um, they have met some of these patients repeatedly and on a second and third meeting uh, the patient the the HSAMs fail to recognize the scientist who they've met on several prior so they make mistakes they're not they're not perfect they, they sometimes don't recognize people that you think they should because they spent a whole lot of time with the person on a prior occasion. They make mistakes in the false memory uh, paradigms. They're special, um, but it doesn't mean they're perfect. Mm. That's fascinating. Um, I, I appreciate you mentioning this study. I was not aware of it. So yeah, they, they, they too are subject to the misinformation effect that is very interesting yeah well you can you know i've got you can download the paper off of my uc irvine website you okay. know just help yourself if you want to take a look at the details i will wow okay hmm well let me let me ask you this question i want to know how all of your knowledge about all of this affects your personal life and your own experience of your memories. I know, um, you know, not to <laughs> expose information you're not ready to share, but just because it's online, if you Google you, I know you're in your 70s now. And so you have many memories to look back upon. And so I'm wondering how this affects your own experience of remembering your life. First of all, I think what years of working on these problems have taught me is to be a more tolerant person so when friends or family members you know make a mistake and remember something that seems wrong to me or even i myself remember something that is wrong you, i don't immediately assume they're deliberately lying or deliberately trying to deceive me um i understand this is just a a, a distorted or a false memory and I think that's a much kinder way to, to feel about other people, a, a, a more tolerant way to feel about people. And we'd all be better off if we didn't just accuse other people of being big fat liars. Now that's not, that doesn't mean that I, I know there are some liars out there and I've even uh, called some of them out on it. Mm -hmm. um, but many times when people remember something wrong, they're not deliberately lying. Mm. I'm taking that to heart. Yeah, that's, that's very important because I think we're all particularly offended by the sense that we're being lied to and that, someone, yeah. and, and that someone is denying that they're lying. So the thought that someone really isn't lying, but they're misremembering. Yeah, I can totally see how that makes you a more tolerant person. And, and you know, this could come in handy when um, well, th this has been documented every now and then siblings will hijack one sibling will hijack the memory of another. A sibling will describe an experience. The other one will says, wait, no, that didn't happen. That happened to me. And, and it's clear that the hijacker has, uh, yeah, has hijacked the sibling's memory. Um, and it, People don't like that when it happens to them. But if you understand that your sibling maybe is just making a kind of normal, natural memory mistake, it's a kinder way to feel about your sibling. Totally. Hmm. 
What about some of your most cherished memories from childhood and from your, you know, young adulthood? Do you find yourself, um, you know, reminiscing? And does it matter whether they are perfectly accurate to you? Uh, I don't. I don't know that it matters that they're perfectly accurate. Um, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Um, we. People in general will have memory mistakes that they make. These have been documented in research um, that make them feel better about themselves. So there's, there's scientific work that shows that people remember their grades were better than they really were, or they gave more to charity than they really did, or they voted in elections they didn't vote in, or they had kids that walked and talked in an earlier age than they really did. These are prestige enhancing memory distortions that maybe make us feel a little better about ourselves. And interestingly, uh, depressed people don't do this as much, which is why they, they are sometimes referred to as, as being sadder but wiser. Mm. So I think, okay, if a little bit of memory distortion can elevate your mood and make you feel a little better about yourself, you know, what's the harm? Mm. I mean, you know, you can't take it too far or, or other people are going to really resent you, as in the stolen valor cases where people are remembering they had wartime experiences that they didn't have. Oh, wow. Had, I don't know about this. Oh, yeah. You just Google stolen valor and you can, you know, you can see some of these uh, examples. Some of them are probably big fat lies, but others are people who um, may have truly just adopted a false memory that mm. makes you feel better. But if you, you get caught at something like that, it can, it can produce some harm for you. So, so, but I don't know if, if I think that I got, you know, all A's in college instead of, you know, some of those B's or B minuses that I might've really gotten. I mean, you know, as long as I, I don't lie in court about it, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's not all that bad. Right, right. And I, I, I like the phrase you used there. I hadn't heard that before. Prestige enhancing memory distortions. That's great. And, yeah. you know, and I, as I reflect on it, like I'll share that one of my very cherished and earliest memories is so I'm, I'm the oldest of three brothers. And I have this memory of when I was probably four and my youngest brother was one, somewhere between one and two, uh, me and my brother Daniel, my middle brother, we would hear him, young Adam, crawling out of his crib and we would go up to his door and we could hear that he was crawling along the floor toward the door and he would stick his little toddler fingers under the door and we would just touch his hand. <laughs> And I, I can see it in my mind now, his little fingers coming through the door and me just touching them gently. And when I start to ask myself the question, did that really happen? And is that how it happened? I find that I think I would cherish it less if it came to light that that never actually happened or that the details were dramatically distorted. So in my perspective, I do notice that I want to remember what is real and that in the things that I cherish and kind of take with me into my older years, I want to know that that's really an accurate account of my life. And at the same time, I totally see what you're saying too. I'm sure I have memory, many prestige enhancing memory distortions as well that I'm you know, not going to bother digging up and exposing right now. So it's just, it's interesting. And on this note, I wonder if there's the opposite effect of not only like, you know, you, you mentioned that depressed people don't do this as much. I wonder if severely depressed people have the equal opposite distortion where, you know, they, for example, remember themselves, you know, 
messing up in a performance much worse than it actually was or they remember that they got all d's when they actually got c's do you have any sense of whether that ever happened? Uh, i don't know about that i mean i because uh, i don't know enough of you know i don't have a thorough knowledge of the the literature on depression and memory i just kind of have bits and pieces of that but uh, that that would be something interesting to look at yeah with some of these other uh you know do, do, known distortions that do occur right would they remember they gave less to charity than they really did or that they didn't vote in elections they actually voted in right. or, oh. exactly hmm this is just so thought-provoking all of this so if I may ask this, what's, what's next for you? I know you, you've had just such a successful career as a cognitive scientist, and I'm curious to know how long do you plan to continue researching and, and what lies ahead? Well, I, I, I mean, I run, still run, I'm running my lab, and you know, right now I happen to be on sabbatical, so I'm not teaching this, uh, this quarter, but I'm running the lab this quarter on Zoom, of course, during COVID, and um, trying to write a few pieces with uh, graduate students and former graduate students. Um, we've uh, just, I mean, within the last two days, published a, a short paper on misinformation and disinformation through social media about COVID and political issues and how it's polarizing society uh, because, um, as we review in this piece, we have uh, recent, not so recent work that shows that people are more likely to fall for fake news and fake misinformation if it fits with their preconceptions, if it, if it supports their already existing biases. And, and I think this is helping to separate us, divide us in society. So I've been, I've been thinking about the relationship between um, my work and that kind of societal problem. Very interesting and relevant. So let me just get that straight and also just kind of highlight and emphasize that. You are saying that people are, are particularly susceptible to these memory distortions when it essentially serves their existing biases. Yes. Yeah, so, so for example, w uh, in one study we showed uh, doctored photographs that made uh, President Obama look bad. Well, the conservative Republicans were more likely to fall for this doctored photograph and think they'd seen it in the news before than the liberal uh, Democrats. And conversely, if you sh show a doctored photograph that makes the former President Bush look bad, um, then the conservative uh, Republicans are sort of less likely to fall for it. So that that's a, one example of what what might be an example of sort of motivated false memory uh, distortion. Mm, it's a good, good way to put it. Motivated false memory distortion. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, is, is there a solution to this? It's, this seems pretty dangerous actually. And then when you add to this, just the phenomenon of like, I think it's called source bias or something to do with basically misremembering the source of your information. Yeah, source you, misattribution. Source yeah. misattribution. Well, that's when you something seems familiar and you 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 misattribute the source. That's what the misinformation effect is all about. Mm. Oh, a yield sign. That sounds familiar. I think I saw it in the accident. Mm. But wasn't you know it might not have been in the accident it might have been in the story that somebody else told you afterwards mm. Mm. and it's you know dangerous when when someone is attributing the information to a very credible source when it actually came from a, tr a source that's not trustworthy so what is well, what's that's, a, that's another problem that social psychologists have studied for a long time the whole you know the sleeper effects where if it's not a credible source, you might be able to reject it in the short term, but down the road, it sounds familiar and you forget that it was a lousy source. Right. And it comes back and influences you. Right. So what, it's a, it's a hard question to answer, but whatever thoughts come to mind, I'm sure will be valuable here. What can we do about this? How can we attempt to 
preserve the integrity of information online? Oh, well, you know, one of the things that, um, that uh, we kind of suggested in this recent essay that uh, my former graduate student and I just uh, published this week um, is that we, we've got to slow down the processing of, of fake news and misinformation and the sharing of it. And I had this experience recently with Facebook where I was about to share something that some friend, Facebook friend posted. And all of a sudden this pop-up comes up and says, are, are you aware of the fact that you're, you're about to share an article that's eight years old? And I thought, no way, I didn't realize it was eight years old. And it stopped me in my tracks because uh, I didn't really want to be sharing something that was eight years old. Mm. So those kinds of pop-ups that say, wait a minute, slow you down, think twice before you start spreading misinformation beyond your own exposure to it. Um, I think is, a, is kind of a good idea. And maybe we don't need Facebook and Twitter and other social media places to, to, to necessarily do this for us. Maybe we can figure out how to do it for ourselves. Mm, right. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great suggestion. And, and to think about in one period of, let's say, 30 minutes while someone's scrolling down Facebook, just the variety of information that they're exposed to is pretty vast. And what I think is very interesting, this is a little bit of a side note, but just to add it to the conversation is the way that the information all being on the same platform creates this sense that it's all equally important. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of like, I like the term horizontalizes our emotional response to everything. We can see something that is really extremely important and has huge social implications sandwiched by you know cat bloopers which are great but just the fact that it's all on the same platform again gives us this very false impression that it's equally important mm -hmm. so that's just part of the problem as well that's part of the problem yeah mm -hmm. well you have just enlightened me today i i I knew that I would get so much out of talking to you and it's been so enjoyable and I'm so grateful for the work that you've done throughout your career and your continued. Well, thank you. And I, and I thank you for, you know, ex exposing me to that Australian 60 minutes program because I, I hadn't seen that particular, I've seen some of the U S 60 minutes programs on the, on the H Sims, but I hadn't seen that particular one. It was fascinating. It was quite well done. I agree. Yeah, well, you're welcome. How'd you happen to find the Australian one uh, or send me that one as opposed to the US one? Right. You know, I, I honestly, I think it's just the fact that I don't know that a U, that the US 60 Minutes has has done a feature on the H Sams, although I might be wrong about that, but... No, they, they, uh, they've, yeah, they've oh, come they a couple of times and I, I would think it's on YouTube somewhere. So you right. Can, you you know, yeah, I wish I could remember. And I'm, I'm afraid to try too hard to remember where I originally found that. But yeah, it's just one of those one of those videos that I, I show to students often and have been for a couple of years. So yeah, I'm glad I could share. Yeah. Well, and I'm showing to the students the uh, Jennifer Thompson, Ronald Cotton videos. Yes, there was a, a recent series, and I wish I could remember the name of Vera now, but something to do with, you know, the science of the mind that came out on, on Netflix, and they had a whole episode on memory. And that's one of the better features of them that I've seen. And it might have just been footage of an interview that was already done. But in any case, that's when I, I really listened to her explain what I was describing earlier about yeah. just the way that her imagination was able to fill in the lack of detail and and then she wasn't able to discern that there was a, a figment of fiction there in the facts well you know a, a little uh, lesser known fact about uh that case is that um after she had identified him in court he was convicted he was sent away to prison 
there were rumors floating around that it might be this other guy who was also in the prison named Bobby Poole who resembled Ronald Cotton. So an, an opportunity was staged for Jennifer Thompson, the rape victim, to, to see Bobby Poole. And she looked at him and she said, no, it's not him. And then the DNA testing that was ultimately done proved that it was him. Wow. You can see that her, her mind had completely substituted Ronald Cotton to the point where when she sees Bobby Poole, the real rapist, no, not him. That is fascinating and disturbing. Yeah, it is. It is. But, but that, that's a fact that was particularly interesting for me. Mm -hmm in thinking about how post-event suggestion can wipe away your earlier memories. Precisely. Wow. Well, I'm gonna continue thinking about this conversation for a long time. I hope we can stay in contact. I'll read your most recent papers. I look forward to that. Okay, and good. Help yourself to the website and, you know, download away. Thank you. I will. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Loftus. Yeah, and my pleasure. It was fun talking to you and good likewise. luck to you in your classes and your podcast and everything you're doing. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Let's stay in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.